We are on YouTube, we are on Facebook, and we are live on the air all around the United States of America and around the world, but live and local in New York, New York, with Frank and Al and Debbie. You know, I have such immense respect for Ed Henry. Uh, he's a Fox News anchor, chief national correspondent, New York Times bestselling author, all-around great guy. You see the work he does for the Siller Foundation, the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Kind enough to join us this early in the morning. Ed, welcome back to the show, man. Great to have you with us. Joe, I appreciate it. It's all right. I wake up uh, about 3 a.m. these days because I'm still in Vietnam time, so it's good. I was, I've, been, I've been awake for five hours. And, and I got to ask you, man, and we have so many questions to ask you, and let me know when you have to go because I know you're, sure. do, you're it's like, no, I think I they're changing Fox to, Fox News to the Ed Henry channel, I heard, yeah, actually. That, no, what they're doing. No. no, that's not true. <laughs> I, by the way, I see you posting these videos not on the Facebook now, on the YouTube, on the Twitter, Yeah. and you post these videos at like 5 in the morning. You're walking down the street and say, <laughs> I've never seen them build a scaffolding. What, how do they do this? And you know, I love that stuff. I watch it all morning. <laughs> you know, I people get to me. It's I like t- your scream of consciousness. Exactly. On the way to work. Exactly. <laughs> I was walking. Ed is referring to me walking to work. If you check it out, Jersey Joe Piscopo Twitter. And I was. People are working. Ed. People are are wheeling things. They're loading in. They're opening up their little food carts. And then the scaffolding. Am I right or wrong, Ed? All over New York. No one's working on the scaffolding. Come the scaffolding, on. I've never seen anybody standing on it or putting it up or hanging around it. But you're right. You know what is cool? That that's not funny, but it's like so New York and why I enjoyed your video in all seriousness. Is that you know, I grew up on Long Island. My parents have always worked hard. Right. And I grew up with that ethic and I'm sure your family as well. Yeah. That's what New Yorkers do. They're up at five in the morning. That's it, man. They bring in the groceries, they're yep. delivering you were you were showing these guys in in, in Manhattan at five AM. Yeah. You know, they're rolling up in the bread trucks and all of that, and it's the people you don't always see yeah. uh, in the middle of the night. And when I'm working, doing Fox and Friends or something and getting up super early yeah. uh, and walking the streets yeah. of New York City, you, you know, you see plenty of drunks. I'm not, you know, don't get me wrong, <laughs> who are just coming home from the bars. I'm sure you see them on the way to work as well. Yeah, yeah. You see all these people with the great work ethic. In it's New so York true. City window before. washers, man. They're washing. I saw one guy, it was 4.30 in the morning, they're washing windows. Hey, Ed, speaking of which, your work ethic, I, and I tell you this, you know I love you, and I, and I'm like I always tell you, you want to Ed Henry, you're one of the great ones. You really are. You're a great guy, but uh, but I have to ask you. My curiosity gets the better of me. You work, <laughs> your work, yeah, and I tell you, and I asked you this when we were together uh, a few weeks ago. What do you get? Three hours a night sleep? I mean, honestly, no, really. <laughs> yeah, you know, four or five is what I, what uh, I do. Uh, uh, I should I should probably get more, but I love. You know, I read before bed. You know, I just read this Babe Ruth book, which is great by oh, Jim Levy. It was like five, six hundred pages. Wow. And I know you're a Yankee fan. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, so when you cover in politics, you try to find other things to keep your brain on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, otherwise you'd just be fried listening to everybody attacking Trump every day, you know? I know, I know. But so when you went and when, when Fox News handed you the mantle of, of really hosting that, uh, the mm-hmm. go the, the Vietnam uh, summit, the, I got to tell you something. You were, you, I got to tell you, not just because you're a friend, it was brilliant, but give us your time frame. <laughs> You had to leave. It was yeah. you were twelve hours ahead of us, right? Huh? Yeah, we were twelve hours ahead. So on a Thursday night into Friday morning, about midnight, I'm at the airport already when everyone's going to bed, yeah. and had to fly fifteen hours to Hong Kong, <sighs> um, and then change planes there and go about two and a half hours to Hanoi in Vietnam, and and so you leave like Thursday, Friday, midnight, and you get there like Saturday at you know. 11 a.m. I mean, wow. you don't, you have no idea what time it is. You're in a plane for 15 yeah. hours. It, you know, you're going nuts. It, it's so true. But you went right on the air as soon as you hit the ground, yes? Yeah, well, I, I went right to the streets uh, with my producer, Matt. He did a great job. Yeah. And we immediately started shooting, you know, pieces uh, to use on Sunday nights, uh, you know, last Sunday night, primetime special on Fox. Um, because, you know, if you go to bed as soon as you get there, I, then you don't even know, you know, you're in a fog. So we tried to go straight to work. Then, then uh, you're right, went on the air. Uh, and look, I saw a president, you know, who did a good job throughout the summit. I think you cannot cover up the fact that it was a bad result. Um, he came home empty-handed. I think we should be honest and direct about that. Uh, but I think that what the critics are missing is that this is a man who flew, you know, uh, was it 8,000 miles or something yep. to try and get peace, right? To try and get peace. And when, when President Trump took office, He inherited this awful problem with North Korea, among other problems, Mm. from President Obama, uh, as well as President Bush and other presidents, I think we should say, in both parties, who did not do a whole heck of a lot to deter North Korea. And there's probably – there's hardly anything that's as serious. I mean he's dealing with all kinds of problems, domestic and foreign. You know that. But 
the threat of nuclear war. You've got millions of people who live in Seoul, South Korea, right in the coastline if the nuclear war started. Not to mention the fact that it appears that you know Kim Jong Un has the technology to potentially have a nuclear weapon reach American shores. This is deadly serious. Uh, and this is a president who, despite all the critics saying, oh, little rocket man and fire and fury is going to backfire and lead to nuclear war, he has gotten Kim Jong-un to stop firing the rockets over Japan, the test missiles, uh, and all the rest. And while, again, uh, we, we can't cover up the fact that he did not get a deal, uh, it might have been good to walk away from a bad deal, uh, number one. And number two, let's not forget where he started and where the critics were warning a year and a half ago that we were headed for nuclear war. And I think we're headed for just the opposite right now. And he's been able, the president, to get the tensions to calm down. And he should get credit for that. I wonder if he planned it. I've been talking about that, Ed Henry. If, if the president knew what Ronald Reagan did with Gorbachev, he goes, I'm going to go in. And then, you know what, I'm, I'm going to walk. I wonder if he planned it. Because, you know, he yeah. is. He's, he's, he's a master at that. Correct? I think that the Reykjavik model is interesting and is something that, that you're right to bring up, that, you know, it's better to walk away from, uh, you know, uh, a bad deal, you know, than to, to just sign something that's not going to stick, that's not going to be strong. On the other hand, I do think that you can only walk so many times, right? You can only meet with this dictator so many times. Yeah. Singapore was a step forward. Vietnam might have been a step forward and a half a step back. Uh, and so, yes, I think he showed strength like Reagan, but if it if it doesn't result in a deal six months, a year from now, uh, and we're back in the soup, you know, with North Korea and a, and a nuclear threat, uh, I don't think you can continue to give him that much credit. I think he's going to have to do something to shake it up. But here's my, here's my view from being there on the ground in Vietnam. Uh, you know, you've got this dictator who shows up with a with a Mercedes Maybach uh, uh, limo, uh, Kim Jong Un. <laughs> yeah, you saw like the synchronized swimmers he has. If you haven't seen this on YouTube, you know, go to YouTube. He's got these like synchronized swimmers in black suits and black ties and the white shirts, like running in unison around his limo. This dictator, you know, through the streets of North. You know, we looked it up. His, the average person in North Korea makes thirteen hundred dollars a year. Uh, the cars that they produce, the limited number of cars they produce mm-hmm. in North Korea, are like ten thousand dollar cars. Uh, meaning, you know, that yeah. he's the one driving around in this yeah. fancy car yeah. and has all the riches, and his people are starving. His people don't have any money, and and so look, I think the president should should keep the the foot, uh, you know, on the metal in terms of this maximum pressure of tough U.S. and U.N. and, and all the rest sanctions, because it's backed Kim Jong Un into a corner and has forced him to the peace table. And so my broader point is, if the president, as you say, was like Reagan at Reykjavik and walked away from a bad deal. He keeps the pressure on Kim Jong-un, and I suspect we're going to have a third summit, whether it's six months, a year from now. Yeah. Uh, and Kim Jong-un, can, he, he can only last so long. He already sleeps with one eye open yeah. because he's worried about a military guy knocking him out in a coup. He's, he's killed a half-brother. He killed his uncle you know, because he's worried about losing power. He's paranoid, and he, he, you know, his country is you know, going bankrupt. So my point is he's backed into a corner, and you know, I think the president, you're right, was smart. He can wait him out. He has time. I think time is on President Trump's side, and he has so far done the right thing on North Korea. But again, he didn't get he didn't get a deal yet. And so, you know, there shouldn't be parades in the street, but there should be credit for him doing the right thing and trying to bring peace. Yeah, the great Ed Henry, uh, Fox News anchor, chief national correspondent with Piscopo in the morning. At, uh, it's about 14 after 8 o'clock. Can you uh, envision, envision, Ed, from being over there in Vietnam, any scenario in which Kim would denuclearize in exchange for sanctions relief? I, again, not today, but I still think time is on the U.S. side. It's not yeah. just when I yeah. said a moment ago, it's on the president's side. It's on America's side. That's what the president was doing, standing up for our country. Uh, and, and our allies around the world. He gets all this abuse for, oh, he's, he's uh, just America first and not helping our allies. What do you think he's doing for an ally like South Korea? What do you think he's doing for an ally like Japan who had missiles a year or so ago flying over its country, these test missiles from yeah. North Korea? Yeah. Is he not standing up for an ally there? You hear all of this, oh, he doesn't stand up for the allies. It's nonsense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nor, it's, you know, Seoul has you know, uh, many millions of people uh, in its capital city there in South Korea who would be wiped out if there's a nuclear conflict, you know? And, and oh, by the way, we have 28,500 U.S. troops, yeah. brave men and women in uniform, yeah. who were there in South Korea yeah. keeping the peace yeah. for our allies. Yeah. And they would be caught in the crossfire. So this is serious business, folks. And I, I think he's he's been trying hard. And, and it's not just trying, it's actually taking action. 
uh, and has made the situation better. The president has. But again, he 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 talked in the campaign about the art of the deal. And yes, as you said a moment ago, mm-hmm. he's a good negotiator. But but again, he hasn't closed the deal. So I, we shouldn't be overly celebratory. He's got still got a lot of work to do. Ed, Vietnam, how was it, man? I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm you're, you're a young man. Ed had me. I'm old. I remember. I'm, I, you know, everybody in my generation fought in Vietnam. We so appreciated that. Yeah. What was Vietnam like? It was fascinating to watch you on TV, man. Well, real quick on on the war part. You know, who would have thunk? You know, yep. like you say, thirty years ago, yep. that an American journalist like like myself could not only go to Vietnam in a, now a somewhat open country, still communist. We should you know gloss over that. But they've had market reforms. Their economy is, is raging right now in a good way. Uh, and w- they welcomed an American like me with open arms. They're very nice people, the Vietnamese. Obviously, it was a horrible situation decades ago. Mm. Uh, I think that, 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 by the way, is a good model for Kim Jong-un, that your country could be like exactly. Vietnam down the road if you, if you, if you come to your senses. Uh, but I was there in 2006 on my very first trip as a White House correspondent with uh, – covering uh, President George W. Bush in 2006. So I I had not been there in 13 years. And I got to say, in 13 years, I saw a country that, you know, when I was there in 2006, it was clear that it was a third world world country. Now it it has a middle class that is growing. Uh, You see hope there. Uh, You know, trade with the U.S. now uh, is, is pretty strong. The president's, by the way, didn't get credit, signed some big agreements, Boeing and others. Uh, it's going to mean U.S. jobs. It's going to mean good things for our economy, good things for the Vietnamese economy. So he continues to make progress on that. And, oh, by the way, uh, he's making progress on the trade deals with China, which is a big deal that everybody laughed at him and said, oh, he'll yeah. never get China to come to the table, never get him to negotiate. But for me, to, to your question about on the ground, uh, Vietnam's a beautiful country. Wow. The people there that really loved America. And, by the way, I don't know if you saw, we did a story and others did it. There was a barber in Hanoi who was offering free haircuts. Yeah. Like only if you came in <laughs> and you got either a Kim or a Trump. So you had these Asian folks who looked nothing like Donald Trump getting like an orange slicked back haircut to try and look like Trump. <laughs> and this, there was this little kid who got the Kim. Yeah. He was a little Vietnamese kid. In, yeah. in, in, uh, yeah. in, and yeah. I said to him, well, through a translator, why why did you decide to get your hair cut like Kim? And he said, I'm a little bit fat. I thought I looked like Kim. <laughs> oh, great. That's <laughs> You know, the thing that kids say, and but here's a serious point to yeah. your question. Yeah. I asked the barber, I said, why are you giving up these free haircuts? And through a translator, he told me in Vietnamese, he said uh, that his family had suffered greatly during the Vietnam War, just like a lot of Americans yeah. suffered, obviously, yeah. that we yeah. didn't forget. Yeah. And he said, I don't want to see war. And I, I appreciate that President Trump is trying to make peace. Wow. So here's an wow. average barber in Hanoi who, who gets it, who says, I saw the horrors of war. And, and we should try to bring peace. And that's what's amazing about what's going on with the Michael Cohen hearing yeah. and oh. all of the attacks on the president while he was overseas. You know, whether you love him or hate him, we should be rooting for America. And I think there are a lot of people who, you know, didn't want to see him succeed over there. And, and again, I'm not blaming that. He should, you know, it rises or falls on him. He's the one who said, art of the deal, I'm a great negotiator. So he's the one who has to produce. He's the one who wanted the summit. So I'm not blaming others, but I am saying that, um, you know, we should all be rooting for success, not for the president, but for America, because if we can bring peace uh, and avoid a nuclear conflict with North Korea, it's beyond obvious to say that's a good thing. Words of wisdom, Ed Henry. So great. To, uh, thank you for your valuable time. Hey, Ed, congratulations. Being on, sir. No, listen, man, the NYPD Holy Name Society. This is a great organization, a great group from the New York Police Department. You're their keynote speaker this year, I hear, huh? I, they invited me over. I couldn't be prouder to be there. Uh, I'm going to try to run over after Fox and Friends uh, a couple of Sundays <laughs> from now. Look at you. Be Look hard. At you. I got to. I got to speak right after the show. But they were kind enough to say they want to give me a kind of a First Amendment press award. And yep. I, you know, to to receive uh, an honor like that from anything associated with uh, the NYPD, America's finest, New York's finest, who I greatly respect. Uh, there are people around the country. Uh, you know, and in New York City, who sometimes you know don't respect our police, don't respect our law enforcement. Yes, sir. And uh, it's nonsense. And yeah. uh, I know these men and women, and they're brave. They put their lives on the line. If there are abuses, we should call it out. Anybody who doesn't do the job rightly, I'm not discounting. You know, the concerns that people have about policing, but I think we should respect the officers. You know, men and women who are brave. 
uh, in uniform who do great things for all of us and put their lives on the line every single day. Amen. Uh, and so I'm honored to be associated with them. Amen. NYPD Holy Name Society. Ed Henry, I tell you, you're one of the great ones, Ed. We love you, man. Proud to be your friend. And I thanks. look forward to seeing you soon, pal. Take yeah, care, guys. Indeed. Thank you. Ed Henry right there, 20 after 8 o'clock. Fox News anchor, Fox News anchor, chief national correspondent, New York Times bestselling author, baseball fan, uh, being honored by the NYPD Holy Name Society, an all-around great guy. And just, I don't know how he has the energy that he does, Debbie.